Coming up, we take a look at the recently announced replacement to FastPass Genie Plus, Disney releases new art for the Princess Tiana Splash Mountain reimagining, and I just returned from my first trip to Disneyland since I was three years old. I'll let you know what I thought. All that and more on the way. This is Mickey Views News. All who come to this happy place, welcome. Now I'm the king of the swingers, oh, the jungle VIP. I've reached the top and had to stop and that's what's bothering me. First up in the news today, actually before we even get into the news, why does everything fall apart? The one week and a half I decide, hey, you know, I should take a trip out to California, uh, get some footage for this video I'm working on, this documentary thing I'm working on. I'm there my first day in Disneyland since I was three years old and my friend calls me and says, what do you think about Lightning Lane? And I said, oh, the rumor we broke? And he's like, no, 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 the thing that Disney announced just a few hours ago. And I'm like, what? So I race back to my hotel, get all the details for you guys. People are quite rightly already all over the internet, very confused, angry, more upcharges, what's going on? Uh, so then I went back to Disneyland and we did a two and a half hour live stream live from Disneyland. It was pretty late at night because it was West Coast time. And even though it was our most concurrently viewed stream ever, a lot of people missed it. People were saying, where's the video? What do you think about the genie? This is why you should have those notifications on. So what happened is I didn't post uh, the live stream publicly on YouTube afterwards because I got a bunch of copyright claims because we watched Disney's fireworks and everything. They have a lot of copyrighted music in there. And also, so I thought, I'm almost done with this trip, I'll get home and I'll do a more measured, more concise, just do a better job really boiling down this whole genie thing once the dust has settled a bit. So without further ado, let's get into it. Now I'm sure by now most of you have heard about Disney's announcement last week of the Disney Genie Plus service and the Lightning Lane replacing FastPass Plus at Walt Disney World, as well as the old FastPass and MaxPass systems out in Disneyland. And while I broke the news of the name of the service, the Lightning Lane, the mechanism by which the service would operate, expanding the virtual queues. What we ended up getting is notably different from what I told you guys Disney was considering months ago with the Lightning Pass, which was very akin at the time to Universal's Express Pass, where you'd have this huge cost up front and then you can ride rides to your heart's content. And since it isn't utilized by very many people, the standby line really doesn't suffer. There's very few people that are skipping the line, actually cutting you in line at the various attractions. People not paying for the Express Pass out in Universal they do not have a diminished experience as a result of the skip the line feature itself. And I even told you guys I wasn't necessarily opposed to Disney doing something like that, that replacing FastPass Plus, which was notorious for slowing down the standby line by a lot, especially at the mid-tier attractions, Omnimover rides, a lot of things like that. And I think the reason I told you guys I was okay with this idea, the Lightning Pass, the idea that you'd have this very expensive $100 to $300 per ticket per day thing that you could splurge on, it really not hurting the experience for us, the everyday people going to the park, since so few would use it. I think that's actually why Disney opted not to go with the Lightning Pass plan and instead reverted to the original Lightning Lane idea uh, we also mentioned the name of in that video, with Disney probably correctly assuming they can make a lot more money by debuting a service that has a much lower barrier to entry with a rather cheap upcharge with even more upcharges hidden inside of that. Because when you make the Skip the Line feature paid and you make it cheaper, what that's going to do is it's going to enable a lot of people to do it, which will slow the standby line, which will then push more people to do the service, slowing the standby line even more. So the Lightning Lane itself, it really isn't a service. It's the branding for the Skip the Line feature you're going to have at each attraction at Walt Disney World and Disneyland. The way you access the Lightning Lane, and this was very much obscured in Disney's press release, you had to watch a 14 minute video to really figure this out. It isn't as simple as just paying for this rather cheap looking $15 upcharge per ticket per day to access that lightning lane because at the big attractions that have long waits like Seven Dwarfs Mine Train and Radiator Springs Racers and DCA, ones with a lot of unresolved operational issues like Rise of the Resistance, you will have to pay individually to access the lightning lane at those particular attractions. So for the mid-tier attractions, if you've got the Disney Genie Plus add-on, which is $15 in Walt Disney World per ticket per day and $20 in Disneyland per ticket per day, that'll allow you the day of to go into the Walt 
Disney World or Disneyland app and book your first Lightning Lane on Disney Genie, the first ride that you want to skip the line for that day. So there's no booking in advance anymore, which is one of the good things with this new system, in my opinion. It does bring back some spontaneity, which is good to see. When Disney is ready for you at that ride, they'll send you a notification and you'll head to the attraction. Once you've done that attraction, you can book a new reservation. And effectively, what you're doing here, in my opinion, is paying to join more virtual queues. The moment where you'd normally just physically enter the line for the ride that you want to ride, instead, you're going to be paying Disney extra not to have to be physically standing in that standby line. Instead, you'll be in the app saying, hey, I want to ride this. And Disney hopes in the meantime, you'll be out and about buying food and merchandise in the park, increasing guest spending numbers. So that's the basic mechanism of Disney Genie Plus, how it will work, how much it hurts park capacity with less guests in line, how much of the line you'll really be skipping, how much of a physical queue there will be in the Lightning Lane remains to be seen. And this service will be implemented on both coasts this fall, Disney says, and we'll keep on the lookout for a more precise time frame there. Then, of course, you have the gotcha, the catch, if you will, of the system, which I already mentioned. What's going to happen is normal people, uninitiated guests, they're going to get sold the Disney Genie Plus add-on to skip the lines via the app on their phone, spend a bunch of extra money on top of their tickets to do this add-on for their whole family for the whole week. It'll add up to a very significant sum of money once you map it out for their entire stay. So once they get in their first virtual queue, they're in the park and they start riding rides via the lightning lane, at some point, they're either going to show up to a ride like Seven Dwarfs Mine Train and ask the cast member why it's not available in the app, or the cast member will have to inform them that the ride is an individual charge to skip the line at, and the Disney Genie Plus service they paid for renders them nothing at that attraction. Or more likely the case, what's going to happen is the guest is going to go into the Walt Disney World or the Disneyland app, see the list of rides that they can start skipping the line at, the feature they paid for, and they're going to notice many big rides listed on there that are grayed out with an additional per person cost posted on top of them. Each service should just have its own name, right? There should be a name for the individual attractions charge. Maybe at the attractions where you have to pay for it individually, just give it a different name. Call that the Lightning Lane and then call the ones where you can use the Disney Genie Plus app. Just call that the Disney Genie Plus line, right? That would sort of make more sense. It'd be less confusing, I think, but it seems like Disney has already decided how they're going to be doing this here. And furthermore, there's a lot of people out there saying that this system, it caters to the rich. And I'm not sure that's actually the case because there's a cap on the skip the line individual attractions charges at two per day. So even if you are fortunate to show up at Disney with some extra cash, at most you'll be utilizing the faster line at two big attractions the entire day. That's the limit. And there's a lot of speculation this may have to do with the new system not impacting Disney's lucrative VIP tour business where you get to skip all the lines. So that's the Disney Genie Plus and the Lightning Lane. There's also some miscellaneous things like photo pass benefits that go along with Disney Genie Plus. Disney also announced complimentary features that'll be part of Disney Genie, which I think is just an update to the current apps, uh, which is sort of strange. Uh, basically, what you'll be able to do with Disney Genie in the app is if you have questions, you'll be able to talk to a chat bot or get a cast member to help you inside the app. And there will also be a free custom itinerary feature if you want Disney to give you an idea of what to do during the day, during your day at the park. The issue here, of course, is the way the custom itinerary itinerary thing would work optimally, uh, saving time in line by recommending you do certain things at certain times, and then recommending to other guests they do things in opposite orders. So basically you end up with a perfect distribution of guests around the park, so the lines are fairly low for everything for everybody. That really only works right if everyone's following it, right? And humans aren't robots, so I think at most a small amount of guests are going to use the itinerary sort of as a suggestion, and everyone else won't be using it at all. But of course this app update isn't out yet, so we can predict guest behavior all we want but we're going to see for sure soon how this works. So to sum it all up here, what Disney's done is create a system that is not beneficial to the everyday guests who don't want to spend more. Now standby line will be slower as lots of people do this $15 upcharge and will be cutting you in line. It's also not so beneficial to the people who do spend the $15 because so many others will be doing it too and it's only one ride at a time, uh, unlike FastPass Plus where you had the three going into the day of, already all booked and ready to go. You also have to be looking at your phone all day, which I am a big proponent 
opponent against personally. I don't know about you guys. And also, Disney Genie Plus doesn't give you special access to the big rides. And if you're rich, there's a limit of skipping the line at two big rides per day. So who wins here? It's definitely not the normal guest, the Disney Genie Plus guest, the rich guest. I think who wins here is the shareholder as the increased guest revenues will be flowing into those balance sheets uh, due to this system that Disney's creating. Also, that individual attractions charge we don't have the pricing on just yet. Disney says it'll be variable throughout the year, just like the paid attraction skip to line feature they just added in Disneyland Paris. And I suspect the reason we didn't get those numbers in the original announcement is because they are going to be quite large. And I think Disney wanted to dampen any sort of criticism towards this new system, which obviously was going to be unpopular when announced, no matter how good or bad uh, the system might end up being in practice. So I think what they did is sort of split the announcement where that other part of it, the pricing details, that'll come out later. The 14 minute video Disney made trying to explain the service, I'll link below. It has a ton of dislikes and I'm always very impressed when we see even like a modicum of pushback against what feels like an unstoppable machine that's just constantly demanding more and more of us part guests. So I was very happy to see that. One more thing with the Disney Genie I want to note and I said this the day it was announced, I don't like how now guests will be able to pay an outrageous sum for a single ride on Rise of the Resistance. It makes Disney's incentive no longer building rides that work efficiently or even correctly. In fact, rides continuing to have problems, people having issues getting boarding passes. Starting this fall, Disney will be profiting off of that directly. Because of the attraction issues, because of the limited number of boarding passes, Disney can create artificial scarcity and in return, since people can't get on for free or the ride had a lot of downtime, so your normal boarding pass is now out of the window, you're not gonna be able to ride it. The one one day you're there to ride it. In return for that ride not operating as it should, guests will turn out their wallets and pay per ride just to be able to get into that attraction. What's Disney's incentive to increase hourly ride capacity at something like Rise of the Resistance and distribute more boarding passes once you have something like this in effect, where the harder it is to get on Rise of the Resistance, the more people will pay to go on Rise of the Resistance. And Disney will profit a lot from that. It's something to think about. What does this system incentivize Disney to do in terms of park operations? Certainly not to have fast standby lines. The slower those are, the more people are paying $15. The slower it is at the big attractions, the more people will be spending per ride, which is absurd to think about. They already paid for admission too, and maybe even a hotel at Disney. Uh, so it's definitely some crazy stuff there. And you could just keep going and going, highlighting all the hidden exploits that are obvious with this system. Another great one is, think about this, you start with a relatively low cost for Disney Genie Plus, right? $15, the skip the line feature, lightning lane constantly has lots of people going through it because Disney Genie Plus is relatively cheap. We see the standby weights go up. If it's anything like FastPass Plus was, it could end up slowing standby weights at up to 80% on the extreme end at some attractions. So you're going to be standing in that standby line and people will say, I already paid to get here, right? Like I had a plane ticket or I drove, spent money on gas. I already paid for a hotel. I already paid for park admission. I might as well pay an extra $15 to have a good time. So you're going to have tons of people that are going to say, okay, I'm not standing in the standby line. I'm going to do the virtual queue instead and then it'll stop being $15. Once everyone's done it, once it's achieved its goal of making the standby line really slow, then it's going to be $20, like it's going to start at in Disneyland. Then it's going to be $25. Then it's going to be $30. If you're a Disney shareholder, I'd say short term, this could be very bullish. There's going to be a lot of money coming in, a lot of guest revenues because of this new system. But medium or long term, you have to ask yourself, do these types of tactics push guests away? Do they leave a sour taste in people's mouth? Or are people so in love with the product, they're willing to continue to jump through any hoops that Disney lays out and Disney will be able to continue adding on up charges and requirements. That's what Disney's betting on. They're very clearly testing the waters here. So unless there is some pushback from the fans, from the customer base saying, hey, we don't like this, things will just continue to move in this direction. So do vote with your wallet. That's definitely something I would recommend. That's really the meat and potatoes of the Genie Plus and the Lightning Lane without all the fluff around it, like custom itineraries or mobile ordering. Like we already have mobile ordering in the current app. What are you talking about? Uh, there's a lot of funny stuff with that announcement Disney did. Like, look over here, look over here. Fall 2021 for the new service coming stateside. I bet you will be seeing some lightning lane signs coming up at attractions soon. So I'll keep you on top of all that. Also this week at Walt Disney World, Disney released some new art for the upcoming re-theme, the overhaul to Splash Mountain, coming to Walt Disney World in Disneyland, replacing the current theme with the story of Princess and the Frog with Tiana and Prince Naveen. We also know from the exterior art, you're gonna have Louie, 
the jazz loving alligator out there. Uh, he'll be in attendance. And I've been telling you guys for a while that I believe this project is underfunded. At the time it was announced, allegedly, this is what I heard, the planned budget was barely adequate just to do the aesthetic updates you see on the exterior in that art. Adding the characters, removing the old theming, repainting, you have the tree and the boat up there. If you recall, when Splash Mountain was built, well before the inflation we're facing right now, it was a very expensive ride for Disney to make. So to properly redo it, it's going to take a lot more money and for reasons I want to get into in a separate video uh, where I'll give you my perspective on the current situation at Disney from the leadership end of things. Disney's not focused on the parks right now. The parks make money. Disney wants to take that money and they want to spend it on the studios. This is just where their priorities are. They have been this way for a very long time due to the events of this last year. There's been some great pretext created where they can say, oh, this is why we're spending less money on the parks. But meanwhile, Disney's still spending lots of money in their other divisions, despite the parks being a division that is generating lots of revenue. So all this is to say, I imagine it has not been easy to put money together to ensure that Tiana gets a quality attraction here. And the other day I put on Twitter the fact that our sources, uh, who are on the money about every story we've broken here, the Lightning Lane news most recently, we broke that for you guys. The sources are saying because of the limited budget you have for this splash overhaul, they can't keep an update a lot of the stuff that is already on the ride. And as such, some of it will have to be taken out. For example, there are currently 68 animatronics in the Florida version of the attraction. And it's sounding like Imagineering doesn't have the ability to redo all those animatronics. So I have heard the majority of audio animatronics currently on the Florida version will be removed. And in Disney's round table, they posted the same day where they were talking about the upcoming reimagining, game-changing animatronics were something that was mentioned, which people saw as sort of like a refutation of what I was saying, but it's really a game of semantics. What I was saying is that there's a lot of AAs that are going to be removed, and Disney says, oh, well, there's going to be game-changing new ones, which no doubt is the case. I know it's being referred to there. Disney is adding some awesome animatronics to the ride. That's true. What we don't know is how many game-changing animatronics. Is it going to be a few? Is it going to be a lot? That's really the question, and this sort of kicked off a debate online where some people are saying they'd rather have two or three game-changing animatronics versus 68 more rude rudimentary animatronics. Let me know where you guys fall on that one. I think the more kinetics a theme park attraction has, the better. So I'd rather have lots of animatronics versus the Navi River Journey where you have one amazing one and then elsewhere it's a lot of reliance on screens and projections and things like that. It's definitely a personal taste thing, but this is what I want to impress upon you with everything we're seeing at Disney. Dichotomies like this, they're contrived. We shouldn't have to choose, oh, will the Princess and the Frog ride have a couple really good animatronics or 68 okay animatronics? What about this massive mega conglomerate who puts $70 billion together to buy 20th Century Fox, who makes $20 billion in profit every year, just profit? Much of that coming from the parks, by the way. How about they sprinkle a few crumbs towards this overhaul, towards the parks? Why don't we get some new rides? Why don't we get some ride updates? This is what we need at the parks desperately, and this is what Disney should do. That is my plea to Disney. And also, I'm sure a lot of you say, why doesn't Disney just not do the Splash Re-theme at all if they can't do it in an optimal manner right now. They already have an extremely popular attraction. Splash Mountain is one of the most visited attractions in the park. Why don't you just shelve the project till later on, like Disney does with all sorts of projects at the parks. The thing is, parks isn't able to put this off till a later date when maybe they have more money to play around with, you know, some hypothetical, because Disney in their good PR announcement disparaged the current attraction to such an extent where from Disney's perspective, if they don't do something with it soon, they will look extremely hypocritical, if not immoral, if they don't continue going forward immediately with the plan that they laid out. Hence what I believe will be a less than ideal reimagining. And Disney really made this situation for themselves on their own accord, right? Nobody made Disney put themselves in this spot where they've decided we're not gonna spend a lot of money at the parks for now, but in the meantime, we're also going to announce an update to a very long and expensive attraction uh, that we can't go back on, that we have to do, right? So a lot of people are wondering, are we gonna see screens? I hope not, I'm not sure that'll really be the case. I do imagine at some point in the attraction, there's just gonna be a wall and it's just going to be fireflies projected on it or something like that. You know what I mean? Uh, just to be like, okay, we got this little section of the scene out of the way. We don't have to worry about it. Despite everything I'm hearing is slated for removal here, the fact that Disney is adding in new animatronics, I see that as a good sign. So maybe this will end up okay and all this is a little bit of a false alarm, but it definitely should be pointed out. So that's an update on what I've been hearing is allegedly happening with the Splash re-theme that is in development right now at Imagineering. And we also got this new piece of art from Disney as Splash Mountain's days in its current form. Continue to count down. If you want to go ride the current attraction before it goes away, I say plan a trip immediately. I've heard fall 2022, maybe late 2022.
2022 for the project to get underway with demolition and construction, but it's an active project right now at Disney. It could start sooner. It could start later. There's this arbitrary thing that people have in their head that Disney won't do anything with Splash till after the 50th anniversary. The 50th anniversary means very little to Disney as it is. We know that they didn't really do a whole lot for it. If you want to check out Splash before it's gone, just go as soon as possible. That would be my recommendation to you because Princess and the Frog is on the way to Frontierland at Walt Disney World as well as Critter Country in Disneyland. So everyone, last up in the news today, I've just gotten back from a big work trip. Uh, you'll see stuff from soon. And I know a lot of you guys have been wanting to hear about it. A lot of people have been messaging me. What did you think about going to Disneyland for the first time? So last week I went to Disneyland for the first time since I was very, very little, and I loved it. Is the park smaller? Yes. Is the castle not quite Cinderella Castle? Size-wise, yeah, definitely not. But Sleeping Beauty Castle has some beautiful tunnels that go off towards several lands. They also have an awesome walkthrough attraction inside of there, so I'd argue it actually has some things that are actually better than our castle, uh, other than scale. Although, as a diehard Walt Disney World fan, I'd say our castle is the best aesthetically. I love that look that it has, even in rose gold. And the thing is, Disneyland Park Park, it doesn't feel like it has less things in it than the Magic Kingdom. You know, people say it's smaller. What it really feels like is it just feels like things are closer together. It still feels like there's a lot to check out, a lot going on. And when people say that you can feel Walt in that park, you can. It's all over. It's not just his firehouse apartment, which is awesome. It's the whole park. A random example, I walked into Disneyland's Emporium, uh, which you'd expect to be a lot like the one at the Magic Kingdom. The location on Main Street is the same. Obviously, the one at the Magic Kingdom was made after the one in Disneyland. Uh, the interior is very similar. The style, you have the turn-of-the-century lighting fixtures, you have the crown molding, things like that. Uh, it looks very pleasant. But then I noticed all these antiques on the walls. They're all over the place. There's these display cases, totally the opposite of the modern retail theory we see applied today all over the place, where it's all about how the focus needs to be on the product itself. So make the interior very bland. And we're seeing Disney adopt that in a lot of places like the world of Disney. And then I look towards the toys section and circling it, I see before me a functioning miniature train set. And I said aloud, of course, and people are probably like, what's up with this guy? I was just so enthralled. Of course, the toy section at Disneyland's Emporium has a train set that is circling the room above the guests. This is Walt's Park. I was like, this is so awesome. Just little stuff like that. There's no direct return on investment. There's no aim towards increasing guest revenues or something like that. That's the stuff that made this place special. That's the secret formula. And then I walk outside and it just felt to me like there were more Main Street vehicles and that they ran more throughout the day. They have an incredible flag ceremony. It's like a full-on show and they have veterans and they have the band and they have audio playing. It's just incredible. Mickey's always on Main Street. He's so enthusiastic. There's just so much going on with the place. It's just at another level. It really feels like the people running it deeply care about what they're actually providing, the product that they're actually selling. And maybe that's me wanting to believe, right? Maybe it's more cynical than that. A lot of people say the reason Disneyland is that way is because they have 70% locals. So they have to keep the same people happy and coming back. So they appeal to stuff that fans like. Whereas Walt Disney World, it's usually new guests from far away. So Walt Disney World management can afford not to care about those fan-centric details as much. But I don't think that's an entirely sufficient explanation. It might be that to an extent, but beyond it, I could really feel that affection, that level of care of sort of being the custodian of Walt's Park. Everyone at Disneyland, they are in a rush. There's tons and tons of park benches. I was amazed. It was just such an amazing experience. And seeing how that place was operating, of course it had the hallmarks of Bob Chapek and Josh DeMauro's management of the parks that we've seen at Walt Disney World as well. For example, at Disneyland, the trams aren't operating. The Disneyland monorail is still down. That's stuff that we've seen, and that is clearly indicative of a problem with upper-level management. But things that were within the purview of the people specifically running the park, Disneyland, I didn't go to DCA, by the way. It just made me realize after really sort of just sort of being down in the dumps about the parks this past year, uh, the fact that we continually just get bad news from Disney. I don't like us talking about bad news. People say, I feel like you've been negative lately. I've always honestly covered the news that Disney's given us from beginning to end. It's the news itself that's changed. And a lot of the shills out there, what they've done is just lowered their expectations. They're just going to say whatever Disney does is great, even when Disney gives us almost nothing. The investment at the parks, it's fallen through the floor. And that needs to be pointed out. As someone who cares about the parks, that is not a positive development. It does pain me though, because I want the news we talk about to be an escape from the normal news that you see everywhere else, everywhere else in the world. You know, it being Disney and all, you want to talk about new rides, new this, new that. That's definitely 
where I want the focus to be, and I really hope we see more money start flowing back into the parks so Imagineering can start doing more cool stuff that we can talk about. So being in Disneyland and just seeing how things were being run over there, it just really sort of gave me a new perspective. I realized, you know, maybe things don't have to be the way they are at Walt Disney World. Maybe it could be a better experience. Oftentimes we express a sentiment of not liking something that Disney's doing, and then we catch ourselves, right? We say, oh, well, you know, that's capitalism for you. You gotta be realistic. Was Walt ever super worried about being realistic with his plans? I don't think so. I thought maybe we should reorient our thinking a bit. You know, Disney this past year has made it explicitly clear to us that they feel they can demand more than ever from their guests park reservations, increased prices, Disney Genie. Maybe the shoe should go on the other foot at some point. Maybe we should demand more from Disney or at least demand the same, the same quality of product that we're promised. So while I've thought for a while that it's inevitable the parks are sort of on the decline because there's just not money going into them, there's very little in the way of a limiting mechanism to what the folks at Disney are doing outside of pure economics. There's really not much we can do. There's very little that we have influence over. I think I have found a little bit of rediscovered passion and optimism actually going out to Disneyland and seeing how that place was. I think I do care more than I did just a few weeks ago. Going to Disneyland, seeing something so beautiful that is obviously awesome and worth fighting for, and then also going on my phone and seeing how fans were responding to the Disney Genie announcement. And this is a lot about how much Disney has destroyed their reputation of late, that they spent so many decades building up. The first thing most people thought when they saw that announcement for the Disney Genie, which didn't even mention all the outrageous parts of the new system, there's stuff Disney's yet to announce, Guests looked at it and they said, how is Disney trying to get one over on me here? And that's the point I really want to end off on, especially if there's people at Disney that are watching this right now. The internal monologue of most of the fans when they clicked on that Genie announcement was, let's see how they're going to try to add another $1,000 to my week-long Disney trip with my family for something that we used to get completely free. And you know what they're asking themselves? Is it even worth going anymore? That's what people were saying in their head. That's what people were saying online. And I think people are absolutely right to be asking those questions. If you enjoyed, be sure to subscribe to those notifications notifications on. Expect some new vlogs coming your way imminently. I'll see you soon. Thank you so much for watching. From the Mickey Viz Magic Studio, this is Brayden. Have a magical day.